Hey everybody, Kimberly here, and I'm really excited to share with you why Catherine, the Cities of the Tsarina, made my top 10 games of 2022. off, it's just a really compact game. Um, if the game board hadn't been so big, it would have fit in a smaller size box, but I know that sometimes marketing and making a game box a particular size reflects the kind of gameplay that it is, and if a game comes in too small of a box, sometimes it's implied that it's a smaller or a simpler game. Now, while I think this game is streamlined and straightforward, there are a lot of interesting choices to be made because players are actually just going to have 12 turns in the game. They get to play 12 different times, and that's it, because there are three rounds, and each one of the three rounds asks players to play two cards from their hand four times. There are very important interim game scorings after the first part of the game and the second part of the game, and then of course after you finish that very third phase, you are going to move into final scoring. But this game is just so clean and interesting. Now, I'm gonna tell you about the cards because you are gonna start with some cards on a top row. That's just gonna be that starting hand. You kinda of get to choose those things in the beginning, but kinda of moving past that, what you're gonna do on your turn is very simple. You have five different phases you walk through, and each of these phases does not take a whole lot of time. So players are going to draw two cards to their hand. Yay, it's always good to get cards in this game, <laughs> especially if you have a really small hand limit, which you can expand if you choose to expand that hand limit. But you draw two cards to your hand, and then everybody simultaneously puts down two cards. They program two cards, one into the top row and one into the bottom row. Now these cards are played face down and you do wait for your opponents and then everyone simultaneously flips over their cards and that reveal we are already at step three of the turn. It just goes by so fast and then we just resolve the cards. Based on the card you just played you could activate certain things and that's where the fun stuff happens. So this step four is where you get to do the cool things and is pretty much the reason why you played this particular card in the top row and this particular card in the bottom row. The top row is your action row and the action row is, the, is what you want to happen on the card itself. You essentially are wanting the depicted action and the color of the card is triggered by placing a card of the same color underneath it and that's the activation row. If you place that same matching color under a card, you are activating it. And so that's why you're playing a top card and a bottom card in particular places. So you don't have to play the top card and bottom card directly over each other. You could play one card into your action row on the top, but then take your other card that activates a different card that you played on a previous turn. So there's just a lot of really great choice here. And of course, you've got these three colors, green, yellow, and blue. And it's, it's very interesting that you're choosing one, two, three, four different turns in a round and activating hopefully all four times to get your action bonuses. So there's just a whole lot of choice of A, which row do you put a card on? Do you not necessarily care so much about the action on one particular card just to use it as an activation color? Or do you really, really wanna prioritize this action or this particular symbol on the card that's at the very, very top of the card? Because that's going to be the symbols that you might get to multiply with if you activate a card. Now there is yet another if then you get to do something. So if you activate a card and do the action at least once, you're allowed to do the bonus action that's listed on that card. And sometimes those actions and bonus actions are just fantastic and perfect for what you're planning. Now let's say you don't match the card color underneath the card to activate it, you will pass on that action phase, essentially not doing anything except for drawing a card to your hand. 
Now it's pretty easy to determine how far you've gone in the game because you always start with three cards at the beginning of a decade, and there are three of those in the game, mind you. And every time you play cards, you add one to the top and one to the bottom. So when you play the fourth card in that top row, you count, oh, we have seven. We've played our four rounds in this decade, and now we're going to move into that interim scoring. Or if it's that third decade, you're going to move into final scoring. There are a lot of things that happen in this interim scoring. And really, you playing out your cards during that decade in each of those rounds is really what you're vying for. So there are a couple things like cannon scoring, and that's going to be your military savvy. And if you have the most of those, you're going to receive more points than your opponents. So you might just want to go for collecting cannon symbols that show up on your action row, which is the top row of your cards. The other thing you should be concerned with is book knowledge. And just like with the canons, you're gonna count those books and you're gonna receive bonuses for having the most of those books too. And honestly, that book benefit of getting a residence out on the board and having that network and those connections is really, really cool because not only are you playing a card game, you're also playing this board where you are placing out residences in cities that will give you bonuses, and that will also give you end game victory points. Interim scoring also values getting those residences on the board. So if you continually add, you will gain victory points in the interim scoring for residences on the board. Moving up on the favor track is preferable for a variety of reasons. The first one is your hand limit goes up as you move up further on that track, but you also will receive victory points listed on the line you're at during interim scoring and at final game scoring. Now at this point, you will clear the pairs of cards that you played a top and a bottom directly underneath it. You take all of those eight cards, four on the top and four on the bottom, you discard them, leaving three cards, which is where you started. You had three cards to begin with, and you carry those cards over. Now, the cool thing about this is that you can carry over those symbols that give you the majority in canons and books. And that's what I did when I played. And so I didn't have to start over from scratch to exceed those symbols compared to my opponents. And so if you don't activate cards that you want to stay out there because they have symbols that are important for you to receive other kinds of benefits from because you want to activate other cards, leave them out there. Those cards will stay from decade to decade. There also is a personal objective card that you have by collecting different kinds of resources that are on the board. When you put a residence down, you can take a tile that matches that symbol and put it onto your personal objective. And that's another way to earn really good victory points in addition to getting that residence, that network, and that board stuff. So for me, Catherine, the Cities of the Tsarina is just such a clean, straightforward card game that incorporates some tokens and some board playing on the map. Because yes, you've got to have some presence out there. You've got to grab those tokens. You've got to move up on the favor track so that you get more victory points um, during interim scoring. And you also are receiving the ex like extended hand limit, like you, you expand it so that you can actually keep more cards in your hand for variety. Because when you activate cards, you really want to make sure that you've got the right color to match the action that you want to take at that time. Because every single uh, decade, you have three decades again, every decade is just four rounds. So you are essentially activating a potential action up to four times, times three, 12. So that's why I say it's just such a clean, tight, nice strategy game that comes in a small box and just has so much packed in there. I think it's just a really cool, kind of underrated game. I've heard some people talk about it, but I think it's that card activation. That's where the heart of this game is. And it absolutely works. And I've seen players take multiple, multiple routes to uh, success and victory in this game, going really heavy on the board and the placement, or going really heavy on just core or gross victory points when they play cards out. So a lot of really interesting techniques here, and I just can't wait to continue playing this game. I mean, it's just 
good. It's a good game, and that's why it made my top 10 of 2022. All right, everybody, I'll see you next time. Thank you.